Hey, Econ teachers, I hope you're having an awesome summer. I wanna let you know I made some brand new activities for you and your students. Now, before I jump into them, I wanna thank all the teachers that came out to San Diego for my workshops. It was amazing. We spent four full days talking about strategies and activities. It was great. Thank you so much for coming. If you haven't taken a look at my in-person workshops or my online institute, make sure to take a look at those because they're definitely gonna help you become a better econ teacher. Now, the new activity I wanna share with you in this video is called Lego Towers. It's a GDP activity you could do in your AP class in unit two when you're introducing nominal and real GDP and unemployment rate, or in a standard economics class when you're covering the idea of macroeconomics. In this video, I'm gonna to talk to you like I would a student to introduce the activity, explain what's going on. At the end, I'll talk about how do you set up the resources, things to watch out for, and talk to you like you're a teacher. So let's jump into it. In this activity, students are gonna create miniature economies by producing towers made out of Legos. They're in groups of three and four. We're gonna to cover topics like nominal GDP, real GDP, unemployment rate, production possibilities curve, real GDP per capita, standard of living, productivity, and economic growth. All these concepts are covered in this one activity. Now this activity comes with this PowerPoint and a worksheet that students fill out along the way. You can download them for free. I'll explain where at the end of this video. But again, in the beginning of this video, I'm gonna introduce this like you would with students. You tell your students, congratulations, your group of three or four students have created your own country with your own economy. And every one of these countries is gonna produce one product Lego towers, towers made out of Legos. Your goal is to produce as many Lego towers in each year as you possibly can. Each year lasts 30 seconds. There's only four years, and each tower in the beginning is gonna be $10. Now, Lego towers are created by connecting three of the same shape, not the same color. Also, don't skip this, tell your students, don't use your teeth to separate the bricks. In later rounds, the students have to separate the bricks and some wanna use their teeth, but tell them that's gross because one, your hands are all over it and two, you don't wanna chip your tooth. So just remind students, do not use your teeth. Now teacher mode, you might be asking yourself, where do I get the Legos? How do I set it up? What goes in each one of these bins? Don't worry about that. I'm gonna talk about that at the end. All you need to know is students are in their groups and they each have a bin that has these Legos ready to go. So here we go, year one, make sure all the Legos in your bin are not attached and there's a couple of rules. Rule number one, you cannot dump out all your Legos. You can't dump them out and sort them. Also, if you remove a brick from your bin, you have to use it right away. You can't set it off to the side. You pick it up, you gotta use it. And last one, only two students are allowed to work in year one. I know you have a group of four, but only two students can work. Decide who's gonna work. Make sure they, okay, raise your hand, raise your hand. Who's working in this group? They all know. All right, you have 30 seconds to build as many towers as you can. The rest of you guys can cheer for your team. Ready and begin, start. Now at the end of each year, there's a debrief session. We talk about what happens and students fill out the questions in the worksheet. First question you ask is, which country produced the most Lego towers? Give them a round of applause, congratulations. Oh, you produced eight towers, oh, 10, 11. You might wanna write that up on the board as well as their nominal and real GDP for each group to verify they're calculating those things correctly. So you could put a chart on the board, you know, with group one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, how many groups you have in your class, and then they have their column with their nominal GDP and their real GDP. And that's what they're calculating on their worksheet. Question one, calculate your nominal GDP, which is the number of towers they built times the $10 price for each tower. And since year one is the base year, question number two, calculate your real GDP. It's identical as the nominal GDP. It's just the same number because year one is the base year. And make sure to ask that in your debrief. Why is nominal GDP equal to your real GDP? Because year one is the base year. We're using year one prices. Also notice in the worksheet, I have them show their work. So make sure they set up the equation, and explain how they got those numbers, because that's what they do in an AP macroeconomics class on the exam. They have to know nominal GDP and the real GDP, and in question three, it has them calculate the unemployment rate. Now, I know this is an easy calculation. If they have four students and only two are working, then they have 50% unemployment. Or if they have three workers and only two are working, then that's 33% unemployment. The point is not to give them hard numbers. The point is for them to realize we're measuring the economy. We look at GDP, right? How much stuff we're producing. Also unemployment, and we also look at inflation. Okay, here we go in year two, Towers produced in year one don't count, so have them disassemble their old towers, put it back in their bin. Now, that's not realistic. Obviously, in real life, you don't destroy products you produce in one year, but we need those bricks for future building, so that's why you're having students take it apart. Here we go, new rule, all students can work. And so now every student is working, producing towers. Let's see how many you can produce in 30 seconds. Ready, on your mark, get set, and go. Now, at the end of year two, they answer questions four through seven, calculating their nominal and their real GDP and make sure to have a debrief session where you say, did you produce more Lego towers in year two and why? And they probably produce more because these workers that weren't working before are now being put to work. 
and make sure to ask them, what does that look like on the production possibilities curve? You might wanna ask yourself the same thing. What does this look like? What just happened on the production possibilities curve? Students might say, oh, the curve shifted. We produce more. No, that's not what happened. This is a point in the curve going to point on the curve. These were workers that were not working before. Now we put them to work. These weren't new workers. This wasn't new machines, tools, factories. This was going from unemployment to full employment. Now, the reason I'm doing this is I'm trying to connect GDP and output to a concept they already learned, the production possibilities curve, back in unit one. And make sure each group calculates their nominal GDP and their real GDP, keeping in mind the price is still $10 for each tower, so the nominal and the real is the same. And in question seven, it has them calculate the real GDP per capita for year two. So that's the real GDP divided by the number of workers or people in their country, which is, you know, four if they're a group of four. And that gives them this new number. And again, they have to show their work and the equation. Again, not a hard number, not a hard thing to calculate, but it's a good thing to remind them that that's how we look at standard of living. Now, here we go. In year three, remember, towers produced in year two don't count in year three. So go ahead and disassemble those towers, put them back in their bin. Each tower is now sold for $20. The price has gone up for $20. They have 30 seconds. Everyone's working in the group. On your mark, get set, and go see how many they can produce. Again, it's a great idea to put a chart on the board where students can see what's going on. You don't have to do it yourself and fill it out. Have them tell, you know, tell Sarah, report to Sarah your nominal and your real GDP for year one, year two, year three. They can kind of see how all the groups are doing. And it's a great idea to give some praise to the groups that produce the most Legos. So who produced most Legos? Give them a round of applause. That creates more competition between all the different countries. But the big concept here is for students to recognize the difference between nominal and real GDP. Their nominal GDP is the $20, the new current price, $20, times the number of towers they produced. The real GDP is the number of towers they produce times the base year price of $10 per tower. And you ask the question, why is it better to use real GDP rather than nominal GDP to measure the economy? Well, real GDP adjusts for inflation. And in question number 10, did your country's standard of living increase, decrease, or stay the same? Now they're connecting this idea back to the idea of GDP per capita and why you use GDP per capita to show if a country is actually improving. The only way you're improving is if you're producing more towers, not if your nominal GDP is going up. And again, remember, I'm having them show their work, so they have to have those equations. Make sure they're doing that because that's all part of this activity. Okay, here we go. In year four, towers produced in year three don't count in year four, so take apart those towers. New rule, each country has a new sorting machine that they can use to sort their Legos before they begin the year. So you hand one of these papers to every single group and you tell them they can take out Legos from their bin and put it on this piece of paper and organize it ahead of time. And you give them a minute to organize what they're gonna do. And remember, in this round, each tower is still $20. So of course, the students spend some time organizing these three, these three, these three. That's gonna save them some time looking inside their bin. So it speeds them up. You say, all right, we're about to start. You got 30 seconds on the clock. Again, on your mark, get set, and go produce towers. In the year four debrief, did your country produce more Lego towers in year four compared to year three? And why? They probably produce more because they now have new machinery, new capital equipment, new physical capital that allows them to do things they couldn't do before. Their productivity increased. And of course, connect that back to the production possibilities curve. What happened on the production possibilities curve? Well, the entire curve now did shift. We weren't taking workers who were unemployed and putting them to work. We had new machines new factories, new things that allowed them to produce more stuff. And of course, students have to calculate their nominal GDP, their real GDP, and explain what happened to their standard of living. Do they actually produce more stuff relative number of people in their country? Okay, that's it for this activity. That's what students are gonna do. It is amazing. It covers all the key concepts students need to know in Macroeconomics Unit 2. Now, let me go back and talk to you as the teacher. Now, the whole activity from top to bottom takes about 20 minutes to run to fill out the worksheet and to have those debrief conversations. And this is a hidden slide in the PowerPoint, you know, telling the students that there are gonna be identically shaped towers. If they think they have to do the same color, that's gonna mess them up. So show them pictures, give them examples, hold them up and say they don't have to be the same color, just exactly the same shape. So when you set these up, um, students can be divided in groups of three or four. Don't do five, don't go down to two. So we actually have do have some unemployment. Um, each group needs one of these bins. So this does require you to set this up ahead of time. They're gonna have a bin. It's gonna look like this with disassembled towers. Don't give it to them with them all put together. So they need approximately 20 disassembled towers or 60 actual bricks in there and then throw in some bricks that don't match any of them. So throw in some random ones you get from your own, your kids uh, or your, you know, when you were a kid, your own Legos in there that don't fit anything that don't match up. Now you might be asking yourself, 
where do I get the Legos? I don't have any kids or my kids' Legos are thrown away. Well, you can go buy them super cheap on Amazon. These are off-brand Legos. They look like this. You can go buy these. I bought this bag for like $12. This will give me three or four uh, sets for these different students. I say you need about 20 disassembled towers, probably closer to 15, but you don't want students running out of resources if they're really, really effective in that last round. So make sure they have at least 20 disassembled towers. That'll cover what they need to do for 30 seconds. Also keep in mind, make sure your bins have different types and different shapes in there. You don't want them all have you know a two by four and it's really easy to produce a bunch and the other students are all mixed up. Make sure they have different ones in there. And again, throw in some random things that are throwing them off. So it does bite, you have to buy Legos for this activity, but the good news is you can use them for every single year. Now, I don't think you should buy a modern Lego set because a lot of those pieces are very unique to the actual product that's being created. You need those old school Legos like these. These are the ones you wanna use. It makes it really easy to make those towers. Another thing to keep in mind is in round four, make sure to give them something, right? You don't wanna just tell students, okay, now you can sort your Legos. Now you have new productivity by a new way of doing things. You wanna give them something so they get the idea of physical capital. This is machines, tools, and factories. You have a new resource. If you just tell students, oh, you can do it a new way, maybe they won't understand what's going on there and won't connect it to the production possibilities curve. So in round four, make sure to hand each group a piece of paper or something that shows them they're getting something so they can produce more stuff. I said it before, but I'm gonna say it again, make sure students don't use their teeth. It's gonna be bad, someone's gonna chip their tooth. So Lego or fake Legos create these little tools that make it really easy to separate pieces. They are gonna get you know stuck together. Just tell students, set those off the side, don't worry about them. You know, you don't have time to run around and separate ones that are really hard to take apart. Now this activity is really part of a bigger strategy, which is using students' own data to explain concepts. Back in unit one, when I explained the production possibilities curve, I had students draw right-handed squares and left-handed triangles, and they created a production possibilities curve based on their own numbers. If you do that, students are more likely to get engaged and understand and get excited about the concepts, not just saying, okay, here's a country that produced this many apples and that many oranges. Instead, they're using their own numbers. They're more likely to get engaged and understand the concepts. Now let's answer the most important question is where do you get this PowerPoint and where do you get these worksheets? Again, they are free. I made them for you as a gift. I wanna help you and your students to create more excitement in your classroom. They are inside my Economics Online Institute. This is an online course that I created for teachers that has all the content, the strategies, activities, everything you need to teach the course and to get students excited about economics. The course also includes my teacher resources that have PowerPoints, assignments, quizzes, activities, everything you need to teach the class. Now, hopefully you can sign up for the Institute or attend one of my workshops during the summer, but if you can't, that's okay. I'm making the PowerPoint and the worksheet free. Just sign up for the free trial of my Macroeconomics Online Institute. Just scroll down to unit two. You can see I have the download links for the PowerPoint and for the worksheet. Now, this is actually one of two new activities that I created for you and for your students. The other one is called Ducks and Bucks for Macroeconomics. It's awesome. Stay tuned for a video where I explain how to run that activity. I hope you're having a great summer. I look forward to helping you and your students in this next school year. Thanks for watching. Till next time.